music theory and ocarina and let me just go ahead and give you guys an overview of what we're gonna go uh, uh, through today and I have a couple of examples and a couple of things that I really want to get through so here we go guys um, today like I said we're looking at music theory and we're looking also not just at music theory but at how it applies and makes us better musicians so here it is so music theory go to the slideshow there it is okay music theory why do we need it <laughs> and ocarina all right what is it um why why is it why is it so important as you could tell those two performers they were extremely different one was barely figuring out what he was doing and the other one was extremely confident the other one had instrumental lines could be expressive could show all sorts of things if nothing else music theory helps you be confident but there's actually a lot of really small things and small ways in which music theory helps you because let's first define what is music theory um so what is it um music theory is um the analysis of music in a quantitative way and the oral skills oral spelled a u r a l like listening oral skills that are required to be able to perform with accuracy so music theory refers to that now there's a lot of subcategories to music theory there's form and analysis there's shankarian analysis there is arranging composition orchestration music theory encompasses a huge and wide variety of subjects but i am going to try to condense it to the very basics and keep it as helpful as possible to an ocarina player here is what i found in my research uh researching this so um the things you can do with this is you could arrange you could transcribe you could read your music which is incredible like it helps you with sight reading sight singing and it also just helps you be more confident so if you guys have any questions always type them in the chat and make sure you stop me because i might not see them okay so a couple of strategies and how to incorporate music theory now that we've realized that it's important that it has a lot of different things but let's focus in on those specifics and see what we can do to add it to our practice first the way we learn music, the way you, we practice. So in the chat, I want you guys to tell me something. If you play ocarina, if you learn songs on the ocarina, how do you approach it? What's the first thing you do? I want you to tell me. If nobody says anything, I'll share my experience of how I used to learn songs on the cello. Oh, I have a couple of chats here. Oh, I love these. Listen, listening is really, really the first. <laughs> I do that too. I love that. I mostly play by ear. Hey, Madison. Yes. Um, there is a, like playing by ear is something that a lot of uh, people do sometimes, especially if they haven't formally learned to read sheet music, which I'll go over in a minute. Um, and that is also a thing that I used to do when I played cello. So I, I understand that. Like when cello was my only instrument, I used to just play by ear and I used to learn most of my songs by ear. Look up sheet music on MuseScore. That's a really good one. I like that. I usually get the sheet music and translate it over to tabs. Hey, that's really good. If you know how to translate things to tabs, that's a start. Some people say that tabs, like if you ask a couple of purists, maybe on other um, Ocarina sites, they will say, hey, tabs are not great. Like, don't use tabs. And there's a certain grain of truth to that in that tabs do limit you in a certain way, but tabs are a great start. I am an advocate of tabs and I think tabs are great to start with. So don't come away from this session thinking, oh, Ocarina Owl doesn't like tabs. He said that tabs are bad. No, tabs are a great start for where you're at, but there's a lot more you can do once you realize how tabs can integrate with sheet music. 
um, look up sheet music and transpose it to tabs. Transposition is an important skill. We'll talk about that. Um, <laughs> sometimes with different covers, you have to start somewhere. That is important. Yes, you have to start somewhere. Transposing tabs gives me practice reading sheet music. That is exactly where you have to be, right? Um, a really good point. That's a great point to be in, is what I'm saying. Um, when you are the point where transposing the tabs helps you translate it to sheet music, that's really, really important. Um, but if you ever watch my tutorials, because I have a lot of tutorials on the Ocarina Owl YouTube, shameless plug, um, my tutorials almost always have the tabs and the music right above the tab. I make it a point, I'm a huge advocate. I don't like tutorials that just have tabs by themselves. I don't feel like they help you as much as tutorials that have the sheet music above. I feel like when you have tabs, the limitation of tabs is that they don't allow you to read the rhythm accurately for the song. And thus you have to go listen to the song and it focuses more on your oral learning versus on your analysis. And this session is about analysis and music analysis. So musical analysis is very left brain. It's about looking at a symbol and figuring out how to reproduce that sound without hearing it. And that right there is a different type of musicianship that it is to play by ear. Nothing wrong with playing by ear. Um, we'll talk more about that and expand more upon that when I talk versus um, absolute pitch and relative pitch. But I want to say that it's a really good thing to be able to be at the point where you're learning with the tabs and not being dependent on looking at the symbols of the tabs. Usually when I have a student and they only know how to read by tabs and they are very overwhelmed looking at sheet music. And if that's you, that's okay. But if I have a student that's in that boat, I try to get them comfortable looking at sheet music first because sheet music is so important and I'm a huge advocate of that. Yes, yes, tabs are very, very helpful. And I, I am an advocate of tabs for them to be helpful and for them to help your musical growth. I don't want people to become dependent on tabs and have them only read tabs. But I think if you're learning and you're getting to start reading sheet music, then that's a thing that's really helpful. Okay, so incorporating it into learning and practice. Um, the way that I approach a piece when I first, uh, I'm trying to read it, I do the same thing Jordan said, I listen to it. I think a lot of y'all do as well. Now, I'm at a different stage of my learning. I know how to read sheet music, I know how to read tabs, I know how to arrange, and I um, consider myself an expert in music theory and in musical analysis. Um, I, um, I don't know if you guys know this, but I am working, or actually, I have written an original orchestral piece that's going to be premiered on October the 9th by the Mansfield Philharmonic. So I consider myself, I've put in a lot of hours into the skill of being able to read, write, analyze, um, create forms, and um, just do oral dictations of melodies. So I want you guys to understand that, yes, I am very seasoned. I may not look, look at all the time because I try to be, you know, really like um, about the music, but I may not be super, um, it may not be evident to everybody that I do have a lot of experience in this field, actually. Um, and I've been writing music since I was really 12 years old. So I just want to share the, in my practice, what I've discovered is efficient and helps me. So that way, when you guys are learning your own uh, melody, arranging your own music, this is a helpful thing, things to keep in mind, things to practice and incorporate in your uh, practice session. So first thing, first thing, learn how to read sheet music. This is, I feel like this will help you the most out of everything. And a lot of y'all, if especially if you're new or if you haven't, or if you've been dependent on tabs, I know how overwhelming that can be. And I know somebody saying, oh, I can read sheet music. You should learn to read sheet music too, is not really going to help you. Because there is an actual method to how to learn to read sheet music. And I'm going to go over that. And if you want, and this method works for some people, that's the other complication. It doesn't work for everybody. But I can give you the tools to at least uh, modify this method so you can have something that works for you. But music theory essentially is a broad topic. And I feel like reading sheet music is the most important part for any beginners or anybody that 
um, isn't familiar with ocarina or is just starting to get into ocarina or into music period reading sheet music is going to free you from having to always listen to things to figure out the rhythm from learning things by ear and having to do things a certain way but to be honest with you there's more than that learning to read sheet music uh, from or sorry learning music from ear is another skill called oral dictation oral dictation of melodies and oral dictation of intervals basically all that means is you hear something by ear and you are able to play it on an instrument if that's you type it in the chat if you have that ability to do that type that in the chat y'all that is not something everybody can do actually that's something that is very difficult to do very accurately but if you can do that if you hear melodies and it takes you maybe a couple of times maybe you have to hear them a couple of times and you have to pl play around with them a couple of times but if you can reproduce that that is called oral dictation and that is called oral memory or sometimes called pitch memory yeah it, it is tricky it is very very tricky usually if you have good oral dictation this is not always the case but if you have good oral dictation skills that means your hearing is really good and you can actually reproduce a lot of your melodies through singing them, which we'll get to in a minute as well. Yeah, so what I'm talking about is ear training and sight singing. Um, that is another kind of skill related to music theory. I'll talk as much as I can about it. Yeah, yeah. It can be it can be really difficult especially with transposition especially you may notice sometimes you know a song <clears throat> on an instrument but it doesn't match the backtrack but when you play it by itself it's in tune but when you play it with the track with the original it's not in tune that means the two melodies are in a different key so that is also again oral dictation you may be able to hear things in a different key and that's also uh, playing accurately just not in the original key so all of these other guys, these are good to know, but I'm mainly going to focus on reading music and oral dictation for this presentation. I will give you, if you're an advanced, more seasoned intermediate player, I will give you a good starting point closer to the end of the presentation as far as some really cool things you can incorporate to make your performance and your practice better. So let's go through to that right now. Okay. So how do you incorporate music theory into your performances well when when things are going wrong shoot oh my gosh i forgot i had a memory slip oh my goodness i'm so nervous i don't know what to do oh i forgot the way the song goes oh i can't play that part intervallic memory finding one interval and being anchored in that interval like so me if your melody starts with just so me and that's like the first interval of your melody if it starts with those two notes i bet you you your muscles will remember if you remember the first two notes so how music theory can save your butt <laughs> is if you're in a performance and you forget something and you or you don't remember or you don't know very well how to play something if you put those two together and you find that intervallic memory uh, like you find the first interval between the two notes and you're like, oh, I remember that's a that's a that's a minor third. That's a descending minor third. You can try to figure that out if you know what the interval is. Now, form analysis. If you, by memory, need to uh, remember the form of a song, it has like A, B, A, or it has verse, chorus, verse, chorus, right? The form analysis, music theory version, if you analyze the song and you write it on a piece of paper, when I memorize the song, I write it on a piece of paper. I don't write musical notes. I just write the names of the sections of the music. I write intro, verse, chorus, or when I'm learning classical song, I write, I write them in form and analysis, analysis form, like A, B, A, tertiary, binary form, stuff like that. And what I mean by that is really... I'm marking out the sections of the music so that way when I'm memorizing something I have that written out and I know what melody is played at what time because sometimes we may not realize that we look at a piece of music and we're like let me memorize every single note of every single measure no I think that that's not the best way to memorize a song 
usually, and I'm saying usually, with the exception of 12 tone or a couple of other compositions that are just not following a lot of music uh, forms, music repeats a lot. There's a lot of repetition in music. And you can actually find lines that repeat and mark them together. That's what I mean by form and analysis. By finding those kind of markers of where your music repeats, that helps you memorize it and it helps you put together a better performance. Even if you don't memorize it, say your pianist gets off at the wrong section and starts playing at a different one. If both of y'all know that you guys are supposed to come in together at letter rehearsal letter C and that's the when the theme comes back, then both of y'all will anchor that and know that. And music theory is how that'll save your uh, performance. Now, <clears throat> I've done this before. I'm a little embarrassed to admit it, but when I don't know a song or when I forget the notes to a song, sometimes I can improvise it on the spot because if I forget something, like if I have enough knowledge of what key it's in and what notes and scale it uses, I can ju just do something that sounds nice in that key. <laughs> and that's how music the theory can also save your butt when things are going wrong. Now, say you're having a great performance, but like you really want to make it better. Now, to be able to enhance your show using the magical powers of music theory, you could, this is geared towards the more intermediate people in the room. So if uh, you already know how to read sheet music and you already know like a whole lot of stuff about it, you are welcome if you're performing with a group, say you're performing with a makeshift ensemble and there's a guitar player, or there's a singer or something, you can harmonize with them. You have to start a major third, or not a major third, but you have to start a third. It could be major minor. You have to start a third higher than their melody and just follow the contour of the melody major minor thirds as you go following the key signature of that. And you can harmonize with them on the spot. If you can hear it, if you have the oral skills to hear that harmony line in your head before you play it, that's really, really good. But if you can't hear it, that's okay too. If you just know that harmony and harmonizing is usually in thirds, like if they're on a do, and then you go to their me. And what I mean by that is if they're on the first scale degree, go to the third scale degree. Um, now, of course, obviously not every melody will start on a do or on the first scale degree but do your best to figure out what scale degree they're starting on and then try to see if you could harmonize with them. Sometimes you could do it on the spot. Now, identifying your key signature, identifying your intervals, all of these help you play with other musicians more accurately and with a bigger tool toolkit and a bigger, bigger tool set. Um, something I like to call my tonality radar, which we'll talk about in a minute. And your transition, say you're you know, you're programming a song. You're like, I don't know what, what, what sounds good to me to put first or to put second. I have no idea how to like make it so that it's like a good order of music that I'm playing at my concert. Consider what key is each piece in? If you have a key or a piece in E major, try not, try to not program it next to the one that's in E flat major. If you have, you know, one in E major, one in E flat major the audience might find that half step jarring, right? So if you're in E major and you're playing something in E major, let me uh, get an example here real quick. Okay, actually this is technically E minor to E flat major, but you kind of get the idea. So if I'm performing the Harry Potter theme, right? Right after that performance, I start playing Hero 2, which is an E-flat. I guess the sound cut out for a minute. Can you guys hear me again? Okay, good. But the sound didn't cut out for too long, I hope. <laughs> okay, good. All right, thank you. Well, I was just gonna say, um, 
I, I was talking about Harry Potter and uh, My Hero Academia, so... And then I start playing something e in E flat. It just sounds weird to me because, like I said, E minor, and I guess that one doesn't sound that bad because it's minor to major, so there's actually a little bit of relationship there. But if you take a half step and a whole step relationship, sometimes it does sound really jarring to the listener. Uh, also consider, you know, what um, note your piece ends on. If your piece ends on a G, and you were just playing in G minor, right? Like you were, um, made that transition work why because d was the last note that uh, zelda's lullaby ends on and zelda's lullaby i was playing it in c major and d was the first note of swallowtail jig and i was playing swallowtail jig in d minor so c major to d minor that is a major second or a whole step going from one that's from a lower key to a higher key, modulating from one key to uh, from a lower key to a higher key, makes it exciting. So also the tempo helped that, like the meter changing the meter and stuff like that. It really helped. Um, so finding transitions like that in your music, that's a really good transition right there. It goes from a lower key to a higher key, and it goes from a slower piece in four to a faster piece in six eight, and that kind of transition is extremely uh, good in a concert. Now you don't have to again play like me, you can find your own way to transition from performances and from pieces. Um, and it's okay if like you like to break in between pieces and you don't like to play them back to back. But it's really cool to find these little tidbits and tricks to help with that. Now let's talk about how to read sheet music. Because a lot of y'all are on the spectrum of, um, or on the side of the spectrum of, hey, I'm barely starting, or hey, I have been playing, but I like tabs a lot better, and I don't feel super comfortable looking at sheet music just by itself. So here is a little bit of a really quick guide, and I'm going to be sharing this presentation with you guys so you guys can have access to all the interactiveness of this. And some of y'all, I'm gonna actually ask a lot of y'all in the chat to participate and help me with this. So please be ready, pay attention. This is my teacher coming out. Pay attention, because um, there's gonna be a quiz after this. Okay, so the spaces on the treble clef and the ocarina only reach treble clef with the exception of um, the exception of one uh, person I found that actually puts things in bass clef. Um, but for the most part, everybody reads treble clef. F, A, C, E are the spaces on the treble clef. So on the staff, you have five lines for spaces. The spaces represent F, A, C, E on the treble clef. G if you go up to this top space and D if you go to this bottom space. The lines are E, G, B, D, F from bottom to top, always from bottom to top. And you could use an acronym. Old school music teachers say every good boy does fine, but that sounds kind of lame to me. So I like every green bus drives fast. Elvis's guitar broke down Friday or every good burger deserves fries. Pick your favorite. So, uh, anyway, yeah, I want you guys to remember that, like, remember, it's screenshot it, take a picture right now if you need it, because it's going to go away. Yeah, and, and like I said, there's a quiz after this, so if you need to take a picture now. <laughs> yeah, that one's a funny one, isn't it? So t take a picture, look at it right now. Okay, everybody good? Are we ready for the next part? All right, ready or not, here we go. 
we're gonna go for it because we're running short on time and I want to get to the other parts of my presentation all right so here is this lovely um, note trainer from the website Richmond Music School sorry if my cats are loud so from Richmond Music School we're gonna play we're gonna do treble clef we're gonna do beginner you have this long, tell me in the chat what note it is. I'll do the first one for you, but you have to tell me the next one, chat, so be ready. What's that one, y'all? What's that one? Oh, good job, you gotta be. What's that one? That one's close, but it is A and F. Why? Because it's on the top line. What's that one? Yep, you got it, it's a D. Okay, and this one, last one, is an E, there you go, okay, awesome. Okay, so obviously y'all, we got 100% uh, uh, of that. I'm going back to the main menu to show you how cra uh, crazy this gets. Virtuoso, they give you barely any time. And like sometimes I get these wrong because I don't read up like a whole lot of ledger lines So if I get some of these wrong help me out and do the best you can, okay? Um, I have the chat here open so that way I can kind of read y'all's answers um, But I want to try to see if we could do the virtuoso for a minute All right, let's do it Okay, help me out Do it quickly as quick as I can Thank you Oh, what's that one? That was hard. That was hard. G oh, you guys were right, F. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Okay. B flat. Yes. That's what is that? E. G. A. Ah, time's up. Okay, guys. Well, that's how crazy this gets. So I would say make it fun. Incorporate some of this into your practice every day. This is just one of them, you know? Like that was that was really 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 good though. Like this is just an easy way, fun way to kind of like get your foot in the ground, you know? Like this is fun. Play this with friends. You know, get together with people. Let's read some notes from the staff, y'all. Come on. I'm trying to learn to read sheet music. Let's do it. So this is a really good and easy way. The way that my teacher taught me was she taught me, my cello teacher taught me to memorize the notes in bass clef because cello reads bass clef. And I had to memorize them to the best of my ability because I read by ear and that was really bad for me um, uh, by as a cellist. Um, so she just had me sit down and memorize them and it was not fun. But you can make it fun. There's nothing that says you can't make it fun. Um, so I would just encourage you, you're a beginner. I'm, I'm going to send you guys this. Um, post the presentation. I'll leave a, a link if you're watching it on YouTube for all the resources and also share it on Global Ocarina community. So check it out on there on Facebook. If you want me to email it to me, send me a, a message or a DM on Instagram so I can read it. I usually check my DMs on Instagram a lot faster. Um, okay, so that's exercise number one. I want to make one huge important distinction. And this is really important, so I hope everybody's listening. This is, I think, just as important as all the things I've been saying, but I want to really hone this point in because this point is just so critical and so important. Some, pe some people are born with an ability called perfect pitch, and others of us, like me, are born with relative pitch. Now, as good as you may think I am at reading music and as doing music theory and music arranging and stuff like that, I am not the best. I have a friend. You could literally play a random note. You could go up to him and play this, right? And he won't have a piano or anything next to him. You could play this. And he'll be like, that's an E. <laughs> and he won't have to, like, do anything, right? So that... A person like that is someone with perfect pitch. Perfect pitch means that you can hear a note and you see it like a color. Like for instance, I have my little Wind Waker Zelda here. I see that his hair is yellow, right? If I was listening to a piece of music and I heard that note, if I had perfect pitch, I could know that's E, right? 
And if I had perfect pitch, I would know if that E is flat or sharp and if the performer is playing it flat or sharp. Very few people are gifted with that ability and that's something you cannot learn. There are um, studies about how you are not able to learn that unless you're under the age of nine. So unless anyone in this chat is under the age of nine or knows someone under the age of nine, they cannot learn it. Perfect pitch is something you should not chase after because it can make you go crazy. <laughs> I used to think I could learn perfect pitch and I have tried before. It doesn't work. You cannot learn perfect pitch. A lot of us have relative pitch, which actually can be really, really useful. People with perfect pitch sometimes hate it because it makes them go crazy, especially if they're playing on a transposed ocarina. The notes that they read don't match up with the notes that are coming out of their instrument. So playing transposed for somebody that has perfect pitch is a nightmare. They, they have a really hard time doing that. But if you are able to hear things by relationships, you're able to hear things in different keys and you're able to hear intervals, you have relative pitch. 99% of us have relative pitch. It's the 0.01% of the population that have perfect pitch. It's very, very rare. Okay, I just wanted to make that important distinction, y'all. Don't get crazy about perfect pitch because, like I said, not everybody has it. You may know one or two people that have it. Yeah, I'm going to read y'all's comments. Yes, yes, I agree, Matt. That's, that's exactly what I was saying. It can be a curse sometimes. It's because we think about it and we kind of look up to it. It's cool that people have it. I bet it's useful, but it can also be um, difficult to live what, but with because you can't turn it off, you know? <laughs> My husband has it, and that's why I'm nervous playing around it. <laughs> Yeah, I I would be too. I have a friend that has it and it's just it's crazy. It's really really crazy. I have a race hand. I know people. Okay, let me go ahead and get the race hand super quick. Oh, maybe it was just an accident. Okay, never mind. If if you guys have a race hand, do let me know. Okay. Well, I just want to say I'm extremely thankful that you guys are enjoying this presentation. I love music theory. I'm clearly really, really passionate about it, as you can tell. And so now, these are gonna be some of our next exercises. We're gonna do oral dictation, and then we're gonna do our tonality ra uh, uh, radar. I guess I'm gonna take a minute to answer these questions super quick, just that way I don't, um, I I'll do one right now, and then after that, if anybody has other questions, I'll go ahead and do it just because we're about to run out of time in 15 minutes for the presentation. So I'll give my friend Jake like a quick minute to say something. He says he wants to say something super quick. So um, Jake, you have the mic. Can we can you hear us? I think you can unmute your mic. Hey. Sorry, it was an accident. Click the wrong button. Okay, no worries. That's okay. You're all good. No worries at all. Thank you so much. Appreciate you, friend. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So, thank you, friend. I appreciate you. Well, um, anyways, I would love to, to the best of my ability, um, continue and just show you all some of the um, other parts of this presentation. I'm trying to figure out how to make this move real quick. Okay, there we go. Okay. So... Intervals are the distance between two notes. And when you're training in intervals, what you're really doing is you're kind of figuring out what the intervals are, right? So you're figuring out, let's do a simple one. We'll do um, thirds and fifths. Um, actually, fifths are kind of hard. Yeah, I guess we'll just do simple to the best of its ability. And we'll start the quiz. And I would love for y'all to, if you know what intervals are, type in the comments just like you did with the notes, what the distance in between them are. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, when I play a C, right? Let's say that I'm playing a C. If I play a C and I go up to a D, I took one step, so that's a second. If I go from a C to an E, I took three steps, so that's a third. How many steps did I take up to F? 
I took four steps, so that's a fourth. How many steps did I take from C to G? Five. I took five steps, that's a fifth. And you can count it up from the staff. That's the way I actually teach my kids, but this is a total crash course. But if you count it from the staff, you can actually get the most accurate reading. And also, just be aware that there, each interval has a quality. Um, seconds, thirds, um, sixes, and sevenths can be major or minor. They can also be augmented or diminished. Or oh, actually, hang on. Is that true? No, they can't. I don't think. Uh, but they, uh, but they can be major or minor. <laughs> And um, unisons, fourths, fifths, and octaves can, can and usually are perfect. Um, a lot of the times they can be diminished and augmented. But um, that's a story for another day. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about this um, and try to do it. This is a simple one if you're training your ears to figure out what it is. This is all listening, so if you have good listening ears, see if you can tell how many steps these notes are from each other, okay? You'll hear one note, and then you'll hear another note. And I think this is just descending, so this is not going back. So they're just one low note, one high note, how far are they apart? So you heard a short chord progression, ignore the chord progression. It's just establishing the key. What you're focused on is that, okay? Cat, stop. <laughs> Could you guys tell what that was? It is a third. Does anyone know what kind of third it is? Yep, it's a third. It is a minor third. Mm, me, so. It goes from me to sol, so it's a minor third. Okay, let's do another one. Uh, how do I go to the next one? Okay. Oh, sorry. It has you actually choosing the two notes, so it's me to soul yeah it's me to soul it's a minor third me to soul me soul yeah so that's what it has you doing yeah exactly exactly anyway so um if this is kind of crazy for you like this is like maybe too much then just uh like just just hear me out just hear this out there's a method to my madness minor third is correct because it's me to soul right now we go to the next one right I'll play that again. I guess for reference, I should say do mi so mi do. Singing or playing that on your ocarina helps every time so that way you establish your tonality. Do mi so mi do. And you only have two choices, three choices really. It could be a do. A me or a soul. So what's that first note? Can chat tell me what the first note is? Yes, yes. Yep, it's do. Oh shoot, wait, hang on. What? See, I'm not even perfect at this. Da, da. Why is that not do? I thought it was do. Can anyone explain that? Da, 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 da. It sounds like a me then if it's not a do. Maybe I'm wrong. Let's see what happens if I choose me. There we go. Me. 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 It sounds like a major six to me. Oh, 
It was a minor six, not a major six. It was a six nonetheless. Um, Cat, please go away. We are doing intervals. <laughs> okay. So then... Mm -hmm. Does anyone know what the other note is? I'm racking my brains. If it's from me, a major sixth from me, it is do, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, do, do, thank you. All right, so that's great. I'm really excited about uh, this one, but this one is like, like you can tell. You could spend hours on here trying to figure out what's going on. And of course, this is like once you have a good handle on knowing music and knowing stuff. Now, let's do something wickedly difficult on here, like something extremely difficult. Now, with melodies, this might be something that may actually be easier, but let's let's see. the first note you're trying to figure out what notes you're doing right I hear soul in my chat so I'm gonna type that you are correct we are in does anyone know what key we're in we are in A-flat major. How could I tell? Because soul is the, uh, in E-flat is the soul of A-flat major because I've practiced a lot of scales. Practicing scales and learning music theory is extremely helpful. Now, of course, like I said, I'm skipping from knowing how to read sheet music really well to now doing some advanced intermediate exercises for ear training, right? And this isn't really that advanced. This is just... I feel like it's advanced for somebody who hasn't ever read sheet music or isn't familiar with it because it's kind of tricky. So what's the second note? So me, do, me. I went ahead and just did it because we are running low on time. But that's the, that's the melody. When you're hearing a song and you know people that transcribe music, they actually do this all the time. They listen to it over and over again, and they write it. That's what I did for my My Hero Academia video, the one you did, you heard at the beginning. I transcribed every single instrumental line of the 20 instruments I used in that one. Really, I transcribed the original transcription. Please stop, Cat. I transcribed the original transcription, and um, the original transcription was actually just a... The original transcription was actually just a... Um, whatchamacallit, a um, rock band. So that's, that's, that's what I had to do. Anyway, so I was going to say, um, yeah, that, that's melodic dictation right there. Um, the next part of this is going to be chords. So here's how you can actually kind of be able to tell simple chord progressions. So the first one's obviously tonic. Could you guys tell what the chord progression to that one was? <laughs> I'll wait. Yep. It was one to four. You're right. And then what happens after that? Do you guys know what it is? I'm going to do it for the sake of time. One, four, one, four. So you guys, this is a great trainer. If you love to transcribe or write melodies, oh my gosh, use these resources, incorporate a little bit of this into your practice. You don't have to spend hours doing this like I do. I'm a total nerd and I love this and I've done it so many times, but if you guys feel comfortable, like put it to all the chords and see what happens and see if you could tell what's happening here. That is really hard. I could tell that last one's minor. Does anyone know what that one is? 
think th that one is one. I don't know what the last one is. The last one's tripping me up. I really think that the second one is six. Ah, oh, dang it. It might be two or three. Oh, it was two. Wait, it's a minor chord, isn't it? Oh, I'm getting it all wrong. I thought it was a minor two. Okay, hang on. Oh, it's a seventh chord, isn't it? Yeah, okay, I was right. It was a six, but it had a seventh. I'm stupid. Okay, okay. I didn't see the seventh down below. I'm sorry, y'all. Okay, I haven't done this in a minute. So, yeah, uh, one, six, seven, one. That last one seems like a minor, too. I don't think it is, though. I think I was wrong. Oh, maybe it has a seventh. Yep, I knew it. Okay, all right, y'all. Anyway, I'm not going to spend the whole time on this. I want to make sure we get to our next presenter. Um, but I do want to, like, give you guys some final thoughts about this and kind of just talk to you about this. There's one other part. Obviously, there's scales, modes, chords, chord progressions, all this stuff you can practice. My favorite is doing modes. Uh, and here's the thing, like, y'all, I want y'all to, this is my last little exercise. I want you guys to be able to tell me what scale we're playing. Like, there's major, minor, once you start to learn all the different modes. Major, minor, what scale is this? Can you guys tell what scale? If you could not tell, I'm gonna go fast. That's harmonic minor. Okay, hear it again. That's mixolydian. That's phrygian. That's Lydian. Oh, that one's hard. That sounds like Phrygian. Ah, shoot. It was not. It was probably... It was Locrian. Locrian's weird. Yeah, I can't ever get the Locrian ones. You're right. You're so right, Matt. Yes, it was Locrian. Yes. Okay. All right, y'all. These are some of my closing thoughts on this topic. And I just want to say thank you to you guys for sticking with me. I know it was kind of a long presentation, but I really love presenting for y'all. These are some of my closing thoughts. If you're kind of left like this guy, kind of just like, oh my gosh, that just went over my head. That's okay. Because like I said, your first step is meeting yourself where you're at. If you don't know how to read sheet music, reading sheet music is the first thing. Um, learning a basic solfege pattern, like do mi so mi do is also really helpful learning the scales on your ocarina if you don't want to learn it on singing play it on your ocarina oh my gosh i'm not in the right key learn your scales like your that was a d d major arpeggio haven't warm, warmed up please don't judge me um d major scale right there so definitely keep that in mind your scales scale work is really important if you find how to read the notes and you're able to learn your basic c major scale while reading it and you're able to use your note trainer you can do so much more than just playing by ear it'll help you so much if you're good at playing by ear train your ear to be better Train your ear to have intervals, to recognize intervals, to recognize scales, to recognize chords, to recognize chord progressions. I was so bad at those chord progressions. Did you hear how I didn't even hear the sevens? And some people in my chat, they were saying, that's a um, that's a subdominant with a seventh. And I was like, oh my gosh, or so, sorry, a super dominant with a seven. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have no idea. So again, I want you guys to feel empowered by music theory and by reading sheet music, not intimidated by it. There is a lot to do for it. But if you sit down, you use these tools, the note trainer, and any of these things, then 
it is very helpful. There's other ways to do it because not everybody learns the same way, so the note trainer might not work for you. You may learn better by just writing out the C major scale and playing it. If that's how you learn, do that and practice however you can. Add this to your practice, add this to your performance. I cannot tell you how much it's changed my performance and how much it allows me to do on an everyday basis. I just want to say thank you to you guys for sticking with me today. And once again, you guys are amazing. Very, very amazing. And I have a whole lot of fun with these spicy non-leading harmony things, you know. <laughs> you guys are amazing. And um, like I saw you guys getting all these chord progressions being so awesome. So I, I loved it. I had so much fun watching the chat, y'all. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you again. I'm just, I'm, if you have any questions or you want a copy of this presentation, me send me a message on Instagram, send me a message on Facebook. Subscribe to my YouTube, Ocarina Owl. I'll leave a, ch uh, a thing below right there. I have to do that as a shameless plug because again, as I said, um, I am a musician full time and I have to, to the best of my ability, um, try to make a book. So if you guys would subscribe, to my YouTube channel, I would sincerely appreciate that, or if you would follow me on Instagram, whatever. Um, we're gonna have an amazing con uh, presentation that actually goes very much with what we were talking about this morning. How to spot pieces that are good for Ocarina, right? How to spot pieces that are good for Ocarina. Um, uh, by Presented by Timothy Kern Abrab. I'm gonna take just a minute to um, send all of that to all the permissions to him so he can start turning on his camera right now because it's 1101. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everybody uh, for being here and thank you to every single person that was participating in the chat. Keep giving our presenters a really good warm welcome and thank you. So let's welcome Timothy Kernabrob. He is an amazing person that I admire and respect because just like I've put together a lot of arrangements, this guy cranks out arrangements like like they're candy it's like he just like puts them out and it's like so fast i love learning from tim he is just uh and i've heard his music and i've listened to a lot of the arrangements that he puts together i gave you panelists by the way um i have heard his music and i have um really like connected with a lot of the methods that he uses with music theory with oral skills and things like that so tim can you hear me you should be able to turn your camera on now okay so can you hear me first of all yes we can hear you hey tim hey good morning yeah. hey, thank you i actually had another zoom window open for some reason i was like i can hear you talk but i don't see you but now i think i'm good Oh, good. So, good. And I loved uh, your little uh, little uh, intro for me. I was I was blushing a little bit. So. <laughs> Thanks, man. Well, I appreciate you. Thank you for being here. I know um, Tim was um, he is the leader. Just as a, uh, another note that I don't want to forget, he is the leader and I think founder of Shooting Star Ocarina, an amazing online ocarina septet. I'll let him talk more about that, but I think he's an amazing musician. And let's, in the chat, welcome him. Give him a warm welcome and applause. Let's welcome him. Hey, Tim, take it away. Hello, everybody. Yes, uh, Nicholas uh, did a great intro for me. Um, I started my ocarina journey back in 2019. Um, a little bit of my background, I am a music teacher. Uh, I teach junior high band and I am a lover of the clarinet and um, I love instrument ensembles and during the pandemic it kind of opened up some time for me to explore learning another instrument and I fell in love with the ocarina and all its possibilities and I used kind of my background as a band teacher to um, kind of in my arranging background with being a band teacher for young uh, groups I use that background to start writing music for uh, Ocarina and then it kind of just shot off from there and I just love being part of this community and uh, you might hear my dog whining in the background from me speaking. So I am going to share my screen. Give me a second because I it's been a, a while since I have done anything on Zoom. <laughs> um, it says only host all panelists. Uh, Nicholas, should I choose only uh, all pan 
Hey, um, you are able to share your screen. I'm sorry, my cat is making a lot of noise right now, but it's okay. Um, okay, I see now. Yeah, you should be able to okay. share your screen in the middle. Okay. All right, and then... yes, I am recording this, by the way. Give me one second to break this down. Okay. And I'm going to put this link in the chat here. Um, let me just share it with all of you. Give you a little bit of my outline for today. Thank you guys for being patient with me. Okay, copy the link. Oh my gosh, navigating this is fun. <laughs> okay, back to here. How do I go back to this? Let me see here. Does this tell you how much I know about Zoom? <laughs> okay. Well, can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. I was going to share the link. Maybe I'll do it later in the chat. Okay. So first of all, you have some contact info for me, uh, my email here. And first of all, just to kind of bounce off what Nicholas presents his presentation, I left a recommended book to learn about music theory and kind of to bounce off onto my topic. Uh, this book uh, was used when I was in college for music theory. So you can find old copies of this book, uh, different uh, editions for pretty cheap at uh, used bookstores, um, thrift shops. So Tonal Harmony as a great resource, just kind of get yourself into an in-depth look at uh, the music writing process. So my presentation today is mostly about how to pick uh, music for ocarina and kind of giving a little bit of a basic tutorial of writing music for ocarina and I put some places where to be in uh, selecting music for arrangements uh, you're going to need to to help yourself out with music notation software some people would be uh, you know you can write it down maybe on manuscript paper but one thing that really helps is having some type of music notation software there are free uh, uh, versions out for new music notation software as well as um, paid for uh, music notation software that has a lot of uh, different uh, perks to that. I use Finale um, in the chat or the comments if someone wants to put um, Sibelius or any other ones you find that are free. MuseScore, yes, Sibelius. Uh, NoteFlight, uh, I know is possible. Um, I'm seeing some more things. Yes, now I found the chat. <laughs> I'm seeing all these great answers. So yes, if you can find something that has where you can use music notation software, that will help you out a lot. I'm going to be doing this presentation and that you understand a little bit about uh, how to read music like treble. And if you haven't re uh, learned bass clef yet, uh, that's something you, you should try to learn um, in the future to get yourself better at arranging and writing for music as well, even though the ocarina is generally written in treble clef. Um, a few other things, uh, where to begin, are you writing for a single or multi-chambered ocarina? That's gonna make a huge difference um, because of the range of what your song you might be playing. The key signature, uh, some keys work very, very well on ocarina to uh, kind of be able to play certain songs in a very specific range or you're going down to a fifth below tonic or do, or you're going up a fifth or so above tonic to give yourself just more range to adapt to that. Um, limitations of your playing or players. So when I'm ever picking out a song, I think about my own playing. Would I be able to play this? Would the people I might be uh, writing this music for, would they be able to play it? Um, one thing I didn't put down here is uh, what ocarinas do we have available uh, at the time? So what player, you know, my players might have, you know, an alto in C, do they have an alto in G? Does it have 10 holes? Does it have 12 holes? Will we be using sub holes? So those are a lot of questions that I uh, think about when I'm writing and picking out music. So great place to start for picking out music is 
piano, vocal music, or condensed scores. Piano music for me is like my go-to um, just because I can see uh, the harmony kind of spelled out for me um, and the melody. And does this piece look or sound like it would sound good on Ocarina? Um, if you have this piece that uh, this heavy metal, I'm just giving an example, like would it, would it sound necessarily great on Ocarina? <laughs> Go for it if you think it does, but uh, just trying to pick something you think would sound good on the ocarina is very important. Um, black scoring is uh, kind of the idea of writing in a way that there might be, even though there might be multiple parts going on, there might be more similarities in the parts. Um, either I'm doubling a part uh, certain ocarinas might be doubling parts. So uh, black scoring is always a good thing and looking for simple harmony. So like if you, uh, with your you know music theory background, even if you might not have a strong music theory background, but if you know like your major chords and minor chords, maybe you can pick that out from the piano part or the vocal music. And I generally, when I'm picking out uh, parts for people to play or like dissecting the piece of music, I'm thinking it in a, like a soprano, alto, tenor, bass, or SATB format. Another thing that helps me is having a chart of all the ranges of the ocarinas I'd be using. And say if I know that uh, my friend Zajun uh, wants to use this very specific ocarina for this and it's only 10 hole, I might need to avoid writing for notes that have like used sub holes. So that's a big thing. Like if you're going to be using sub holes or not, and if they're viable for your group or your, even yourself. So oh, looks like I'm copying things. And dissecting a piano piece, uh, you know, you're going to look to see if the melody can be played on a 10 to 12 hole ocarina if you're playing a single chamber. Uh, you know, if you're playing a multi-chamber, maybe a double or triple, you know, you're gonna have a lot more range and more possibilities. I tend to write more uh, single chamber music um, just because that's what I own. And also um, when generally when I'm writing for the stuff that I like to write for, I'm generally writing for single chamber. And say if the piece is the melody could doesn't necessarily when you first look at it uh doesn't look like it would fit the range of your ocarina if you change the key it might so that might also be a good way to think about a piece is like okay it's in e flat major right now and right now in e flat major it's not going to work very well in a single chambers range for the melody but if it was written in c major it might so that's a great way to think about um, incorporating how you can adapt a piece to, to fit the range of an ocarina. Let's see here what I got. Um, also, um, one of the examples I'm gonna be bringing up um, with ensemble writing, look what your best note for tonic is for your highest and lowest ocarina or even if you're single chamber, like it's, or it's not single, just playing by solo, you know, is, you know, do you have enough range, like on the low end and high end to be able to play the melody? So, or are you going to need a, a multi-chamber for that? So I'm always looking what I can find for my lowest and highest note in my ocarinas. And will the harmony fit well in the inner voices of like the alto and tenor kind of ranges? And even though um, we have alto ocarinas, um, I'm thinking of just like how, if you're thinking of voices, how I'm putting the chord stacking it with like the bass, tenor, alto and soprano, how I'm thinking about that, where I'm placing each note um, more than the actual, like, like this is not a tenor ocarina or alto ocarina at the time. It's just like where the notes of the chord is stacked at the time. So sometimes will I write it in this, for inner voices, will I write it in this ocarina or another one? Is it gonna to be too high in its range? Is it going to be uh, blending well? Do I write it in a lower ocarina up higher so it blends better than having a higher maybe inner voice ocarina? 
So those are a couple of things. And the example that I'm going to be uh, using and why I picked some of the pieces for examples here is um, one of the pieces I picked for a shooting star to do was uh, the parade of the tin soldiers or sometimes known as parade of the wooden soldiers. And I'm gonna show you an example of just how I deconstructed this. I'm gonna make sure it's not playing and just give them a second. Sweetwater.com for the widest selection of music gear at the best prices. Experience our award. All right. So what we have here is the first of all, I'm looking at the key signature of this piece and why I picked this. So this first song is in G major. And why I picked this song, first of all, G major, generally, you know, you're not dealing with a lot of sharps or flats, you just got one. So generally that's gonna be maybe an easier key to play in for most people. And then this was the piece that uh, for our group, I wanted to introduce having a contrabass in G ocarina. So I was thinking, oh gosh, we gotta really use and take advantage of this instrument's lowest notes. So when I was looking at this piece, I noticed there was a lot of tonic, which would be do, um, even in the bass voice here. And even if it's written in different uh, octaves here, um, I was looking for see how much tonic I could use with the, the contrabass G. And then also for our, uh, for the melody, I was kind of deconstructing the melody here. And I'm looking at, we've got the pickup, first, second, third, fourth measure, uh, like count four going into uh, this last measure here on the this first page you see here. This melody line, um, G, G, E, G, 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 and then let me pull this up here a little bit farther. F, G, 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 E, G, B, A. So if I was writing this in um, the soprano C or the even the alto C, it's fitting in a range that is very good for the instrument. So this is how I, I was picking out at the melody for our uh, soprano ocarina, like the just the melody part. And it fit very well for both the soprano and alto. I generally write a lot of the melody parts in our soprano C and alto C parts. And looking at our music here, we also had, going back here, we kind of had a high G up here, like a stinger right here. And uh, Angela, our soprano and C player, could hit a high G on her uh, rod or ocarina. So I was thinking, okay, we're going to use that so we can have a full five octaves of range. I thought that would be so cool to write for. So definitely was going to give her a chance to play that note. So that's how I generally kind of start. I'm going to look back at my notes here for, um, oh my gosh, for deconstruction. So I, I basically, I started choosing the song um, by the key. The melody was fitting the ocarina, uh, the G ocarina, or not G ocarina, C ocarinas very well. Uh, G is an easier key to play in. Tonic, there was so much, uh, you know, G everywhere for the lowest instrument now and G, um, expanding the septet to octet, uh, you know, America, go big, go home. <laughs> so, you know, and it adds a really strong base foundation. And um, it was so cool to finally uh, have uh, this piece for Brian to play. And when I was picking out the piece, it had this really cool bass line and the piano later on. And I was like, oh gosh, we're going to definitely show off Brian here. So um, an example of this being a great example of block scoring. Let me go back. Oh my gosh. Okay. Great example of block scoring. There's a lot of even in octaves here, the melody, but also um, you can see in the inner voices how I would um, dissect the chord here. Um, for example, let's find a G major chord or even a C major chord, um, an inverted chord. So right here, uh, we have a G. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but we have in measure five, one, two, three, four, yes, measure five, we have G, C, E, and, and the bass clef on the second count. And then we also have G, C, E, G. And even on count one here, we have 
looks like a C major chord, C, E, G. So what I'm doing is I'm plugging in my, uh, I generally like to really, uh, my baseline in, in, in octaves. So I would pick the lowest ocarina, maybe my contra bass in G and um, maybe even my bass G or contra bass in C on this part here on a C. And then I'm gonna give my uh, next kind of middle range, lower instruments, a note in there, I might give uh, more, like it's, uh, I would definitely want after tonic, we want the most of. So I might, I'm gonna write that um, note to be prominent. Uh, the melody right now wants to have the note E as the first uh, note in count one here. So I'm definitely putting the note E here. <laughs> Thanks, Angela. I just, uh, just seeing your uh, comments there. Oh, definitely get to hear that again. <laughs> that song got stuck in my head so many times because after playing it so many times to arrange us. Um, and one of the things, I, another reason why I picked this song, it was a self-playing piano roll. And later down the line, it's almost like if it was like two piano players. So there's so much going on uh, that I could pick from notes. So this was just one of the reasons why I picked this. A lot of times I like ragtime music uh, because there's also a lot of self-playing piano parts and I like the style for ocarina. Uh, polkas, same thing um, with piano parts. I'll find you know, these songs from you know, the early 1900s and I'll plug them into uh, for our ocarinas to play or even I play. So that's kind of how I've been deconstructing uh, this piece here. Do I have any questions before I um, go on and kind of just deconstruct a little bit more of why I picked this song? Nope. So here's, um, okay, I like ragtime music as well. Yes. <laughs> so uh, let's just look here, even at, you know, the baseline here and measure uh, 13. Can you guys see the music pretty well on your screen? Okay, good. So what I'm looking at here, I've got just like a moving bass line here of G, F, E, D, and I've got it in octaves. So I'm even in this, even in the music part here, I'm going to put it in octaves just for strength. Thank you for letting me uh, know that you guys can definitely see it. It makes me happy that you can. So here's a great um, way to write uh, an inner voice here. In measure 13, we have, let's see here, I believe it's, we have a, a ascending line in the melody. Even if you look at the lowest note here, the lowest note is the same is generally as the highest note uh, all the way up here. So we have A, C, D, F sharp, G, I might be singing that wrong, probably am, but I might have the melody playing that. And all of a sudden we have this uh, maybe high note that I could have put in the soprano C again. And then we have these triplet inner voice parts I could put in to show off another instrument. So I might put that in this uh, G ocarinas. And uh, when I'm making a ocarina range chart, I generally know that uh, an F is a, I believe a B flat on a G ocarina. And so I'm going to be uh, putting that note as a, a B flat here, and this would be a C, and then a B flat again in a G ocarina, an A, a B flat, and then this last uh, note D, I believe is a G. So when I would, would have picked that out, that was a great option to write something that would be good for the inner voices. And I might write this in octaves for uh, strength. You could maybe just isolate it and have like maybe the soprano G. I, I always feel bad for Jolene. Shout out to Jolene. She's such a great player. And just trying to find some good like things for the uh, G ocarinas to play. Um, if you're thinking that the C ocarinas are gonna be generally your melody instruments, um, that's kind of how I kind of picture it. I, I generally pick out my soprano C and alto C to be melody. Um, my soprano G uh, is generally um, playing like an alto line. Uh, sometimes I have the alto G do uh, another chord, uh, uh, if, or not another chord, another uh, note of the chord to kind of go along with what maybe uh, the soprano and G is playing. And then 
uh, depending on how I want the chord structured in the bass line, I might have a strong uh, four different notes stacked up from the, the lowest ocarina to maybe like the bass C, where they're each playing like a chord tone, like a very strong chord tone there, while everyone else is doing the melody with like a little bit of harmony up top. So here's a great example of that. So we've got some more here. I know this looks like a lot of just uh, a lot of black ink here, but a lot of it is written in octaves here. So my thought process is going long, just right side, the person that put this song together way back when. Um, and just if that really good in the range of the ocarinas, oh, I believe this is where this part right here, I, uh, we have C, E, G, A, B, and if with the my lowest ocarina with Brian at the time, this was the perfect time to show him off because I went right down to the lowest G, which would be his C to play something like this. So I was like, ah, that's awesome. And then I'll write the chord structure of this, you know, count two and count four here um, in the upper voices to really get to show off Brian there. So that was my thought process on uh, kind of breaking this down. One really cool thing, and I will bring up my arrangement in here. Let's find, let's find the part that might have had. Uh, it almost seems like there was more than going on here uh, than a normal person could play probably with four uh, or their two hands. So in measure ninety two here, we have uh, kind of a tremolo going on here in the actual piano part, but then we have this kind of upper uh, like descant thing going on where it was really cool to kind of just put this in um, the soprano C playing this kind of uh, really cool melody line while all the lower, maybe the alto C was doing uh, this part here, or I actually believe I had Angela do the, I, instead of doing a tremolo, I did a trill here to have her playing this really uh, high part in the piano part. And then I had the melody line continuing going on with the um, alto C and uh, the bass line still going on here. And then let's see here, got some grace notes that I put in. Usually if I have grace notes, I only put it in for like one uh, voice. Uh, one instrument part so for alignment especially because we were an all virtual group aha here it is um this de ascending chromatic line do, 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 do. what i did there let me pull up the arrangement here and i won't be able to play it by finale right now is being kind of wonky, probably even with a zoom on. So let me find it here. Such a long piece. Aha. So what I ended up doing here, it was a descending a bunch of just notes of a chord. So I tried to start it off higher. And as we kept going lower, uh, this note uh, D, became uh, D flat or G, it's G flat in my, uh, let's see what voice is this, the bass G here. So D became G flat or D flat if it was uh, transposed. And I just kept going down here doo -doo 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 to kind of make a really cool effect. So that's why I kind of picked out this piece and kind of show off all of us all at once there. Let me go back to my notes. Thank you for all listening to me, your great audience. Let's see here. Aye, aye, aye. Oh, there we go. Oop. Did I stop sharing my screen? Yes, I did. Okay. So I'm going to look up another song that I picked out that I really enjoyed was Mayam Mayam. Oop, I'm not on YouTube, am I? It would help if I was searching something in YouTube, wouldn't it?
So here's a great example of a piece after this. Oh. As prices rise, you realize how fast 10 Thank you for listening up. to this ad, sorry. And up. And up. Become a Walmart Plus member and save 10 cents a gallon at Exxon and mobile stations. So here's a great example of something where a melody line fit really well in um, our ocarinas we have. This is in, I believe, D minor here. And it starts with C, 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 B flat, A, G, C, C, B flat, A, G, A, A, F, E, D, F, E, D. Very good range for an ocarina, especially that uh, C ocarina here. And then if we go on farther, looking at here, this is still very good range here. I find that D minor is a great key. Some of the great keys that I love to like search for ocarina are on the major side, C major, G major, F major, D major. On the minor side, I like to look for pieces that are in D minor, um, E minor. We, I'm um, going to be doing a piece in G minor, um, A minor as well now, um, having the use of the contrabass and G being able to go down to um, a low A, um, concert pitch A. So there's just another fine example of me picking out music here. And we have like an uh, almost um, not Alberti bass, well, a little bit here in uh, measures five, six, seven, eight, um, where we've got just a G, B, D, B, G, B, D, B. So that, you know, fits really well in any of the ocarinas in general, even the C ocarinas or G ocarinas. And then I would, if you look here at measure nine, I am taking some of the notes of the upbeats and placing them uh, for maybe the alto ocarinas, my alto, uh, alto G, uh, maybe even my um, bass G. I might even pick a chord structure of maybe it's playing one of these notes, even though it's a low instrument. I forgot, I've got my bass instruments playing an A already. I might bump or like my contra bass and C or G playing this A, I might have my bass G play, you know, an F from the chord. So that is a great way to kind of just play, kind of plug and have fun playing, you know, plugging it in things where you think it will sound good. Um, one of the things that I want, like even me personally would like to work on, I generally write very full writing and not as much, um, exposed parts like um i'd like to start you know getting more into having a little bit more of solo wistic playing or you know kind of breaking up the texture a little bit i have reached out to composers to write for us and i always like looking and like seeing how they uh deconstruct a piece and how uh it differs from me and even i reached out to a couple people that were not even ocarina players and you know, I gave them a few ideas for how to uh, write some music, and it was just interesting to uh, see their take on it. And and knowing uh, how to write for an ocarina player in our abilities, um, personally, me, I'm still working on my technique for you know notes where I'm lifting the thumb up on ocarina, and you know, for above, you know, you know, we've got D even C sharp, even D, C sharp, uh, E flat, E and F can be tricky up there to play. And um, especially if you have large ocarinas, like, uh, you know, even a bass G, bass C, it can be hard to play up there if you're not used to it and the weight of the instrument. So I'm always conscious about how I'm picking those notes out. Can I put it in another ocarina uh, to play those notes? Because uh, it just fits better in their range. And let's see here. I'm looking to see if I have any questions. Um, Nicholas, are you, um, I was just gonna pick your brain if you're around, like, yeah. um, is there a lot of, when you um, are writing music, is there a lot of, uh, when you're picking out a song, uh, what kind of things do you kind of look for? Um, or if anybody else is kind of, what are you looking for in a song? So whenever I'm picking out music, and again, I do apologize if you hear a lot of sounds shuffling around. The cats are just going crazy today. <laughs> uh, but uh, whenever I hear music, um, I will say this. I will say that 
I am very into music that I'm into. So um, I guess I have to be really interested in the piece to arrange it and make it into its own thing. But I will say when I'm specifically arranging for Ocarina and I find that something works with Ocarina, typically vocal pieces, pieces that have to do with voice, um, because the voice range fits so organically on the ocarina. Um, mm -hmm. I like, I'm really biased specifically in pieces that are in D minor. I feel like they work very well with ocarina. Um, e flat major also works relatively well. Um, C major doesn't always work surprisingly too well because even though it may be okay to write for an ocarina, it kind of gets hard to write for a 12 hole I'm talking about it gets hard to write for the lower notes once you get past, you know, T and La. Like, yes. that soul is just really important. So making sure that the soul's soul to Do matches really well um, and fits in a single ocarina. Now, if I'm writing for a septet, I love G major uh, because the G ocarinas are at home. Um, G major, um, I love F major. I love C major for those that they're really good keys for minor keys, E minor, some of the keys that are in the first half of the circle is fifths that just don't have as much um, sharps or flats are really good in my opinion. And I also like, actually I was listening to what you said about the soprano G and I was like, oh, I write very differently. My soprano G player, Travis is always busy. Um, I feel like, um, I guess because I don't know. I'm, I'm really sensitive to sounds a lot of the times. I'm very, um, I write a lot of my main melodies in the soprano G and I don't write as much in the soprano C because it just sounds really high pitched to me. And unless I want it super loud, I actually write it almost all in the soprano G line. And I love to, I guess I'm kind of biased too. I love to give the alto C and alto G a bulk of the melody and soprano C. Like those three are kind of mm -hmm. my main melodies. And my soprano C is more for color, loudness, volume. Cause, because ocarinas can't do dynamics, septets are such a great opportunity to highlight those dynamics. So I try to really thin the orchestration and make it lower when I want it quiet and really mm -hmm. like have everybody play it when I want it loud. I hope that answered the question. I don't know oh, if I gave a good answer. Yeah, and you know, I'm I'm picking your brain again. Like, you know, when I do use soprano G, it might be because it might fit better in that range. Like I've given some um, good things for uh, Jolene to play on her soprano G uh, when it just doesn't, it's not gonna fit well in a C ocarina for the song that we're playing. Oh, and so I might funny. give, I might- Did you see it's Angela's chat? Tim has to keep me. <laughs> yes. You know, and you know, but you know, Angela, you know, she talks to me sometimes. It's like, you know, I don't always have to play, but you know, I, I'm a diva. So. <laughs> so that was uh, uh, a good thing, but you know, I do whatever I can find what I feel like it's what's going to fit in the melody uh, the best. And then, like you said, you can either grow uh, the really by dyna dynamics you know, different, you know, range and stuff like that, or like how many ocarinas are playing, you know, where you're using the lower ocarinas. Um, but like generally my um, melody lines are definitely in the C parts. Um, and then I usually think of my G ocarinas in harmony. Um, I actually wish in some ways, I always go back to this, like in some ways it's, uh, this is the reason I kind of wanted to expand on not just septet, and go down to uh, having a contrabass in G was because I really wanted to hear more of the bottom end and get a true more of a true bass voice down there um, and playing into certain keys a little bit easier that I thought would fit really well. Um, and then the same thing for the range of like the high notes of getting it for you know Angela to play or even you know with Jolene. So it's it's a very you know, you, you know, you're always thinking of well, how can you make this piece fit as best you can. And I tend to write very full uh, writing um, when I'm writing music, um, more like black scoring a lot more. Uh, there's not as much individual parts. I'm working on that as an arranger composer. I no one's perfect, or uh, I just haven't mastered that craft that uh, using that. So um, 
there's a lot of just nuances to think about um, when picking out music. So I love that you said vocal music because vocal music generally, you know, what you can sing, you're not going to go when you're singing a lot. And um, with when, you know, you know, singing something uh, melodic, very lyrical, kind of slow or something like that, it would fit really well in an ocarina. <laughs> I love how Matt just like typed out what I sang. <laughs> I really also I, I meant to also say I, I I'm biased to sometimes cello music because cello plays in a lot of the keys of circle of fifths like G and D and C and usually when I find that that also helps. Violin cello, mm -hmm. cello violin, not violin cello but cello and violin. <laughs> yeah, so. Um... I just saw someone saying with polka songs and stuff, I just find, um, you know, either, um, I know when you're maybe picking out songs, you know, um, for ensemble, you're like looking at piano or vocal music. Um, for those that uh, play double chamber or, you know, multiple multi-chamber, when you're picking out solo music, I think you can look at it a way, you know, what can you adapt for music? So you have a little bit more, um, if you're like doing soloistic kind of stuff, uh, you know, maybe you can find uh, something that would adapt well for a flute or another instrument where you can just plug in the um, parts. What is Angela doing now? <laughs> oh, the face. <laughs> so um, there's just, oh, elbow repair. Yeah, she's doing some elbow repair right now. Um, now I got off uh, track, but I, I just, I really think um, I haven't really delved into uh, multi-chamber, um, but a lot of times when you, maybe you're doing a multi-chamber, maybe you could do like a, vo a vocal piece that has uh, a solo line and then your piano part is the encompass and how you're adapting it. That's a great idea, especially if you can find one in like, you know, the keys that you mentioned, you know, D minor, uh, E minor, uh, C major, or G major, all those kinds of things are great op uh, options for um, writing. Nicholas, is there anything you wanted to pick my brain on? Sure. Um, actually, there is one thing I wanted to kind of ask you because I don't know if you still do this, but in your arrangements, sometimes I do notice that um, you write the bass ocarinas in bass clef. I've never seen anybody do that before. Is there any particular reason why you do it? Sure. Actually, now I have changed. Uh, originally, I did it that way because I write everything in concert pitch. Oh, gotcha. And then I also noticed I, I, I saw somewhere where I did see some ocarina arrangements where the two lowest were written in bass clef. Um, oh, yes. And if I find them, I will send them your way. Okay, I will. I love to see that. That's kind of where I originally started with the bottom two in bass clef. And then I just kind of went from there, um, changing it to treble just uh, from requests for my players. So sometimes you have to work with the people you're playing with, like say, hey, write yeah. this in treble clef. <laughs> I got so, you, yes. I got you. so a lot of it is just like I write everything in concert pitch, like even um, with finale here, if I go back here and I go to my score manager here and I can switch any of my parts back to concert pitch. So right now the CBG um, is written like if it's in scene in treble clef, but if I go here and put none, it's written down still in uh, this like one eight VA or eight VB below the treble clap so this low g would be way down there on the bass clap but um i can change it to where i can see all the parts if i would ch so choose to be in um g is that something you do as well do you write everything in concert pitch or you just kind of no it would no. drive me crazy for me personally uh, but if i had perfect pitch i would have to um i think about <clears throat> g ocarinas as being because i'm a cellist i think about them as being a string up because they're a perfect fifth apart i um, i think for me it's speed for like yeah. you say i crank out stuff pretty oh, quickly gotcha. I, 
it's for me, it's like the speed of writing it. Um, I know some people it's easier to see if it's just written in the way that it should be. <laughs> um, that's why I use range charts a lot, or I just kind of um, know that, uh, you know, if I'm going to, you know, this low, like I'm thinking this is G all the way down uh, here. And, you know, the, my contrabass has, it's only eight holes. So it only goes up to uh, this concert A. Yeah. I'll know to just stay in that limit of range. <laughs> I think it's so, amazing that you do that and that it helps. Uh, for me, like I do the transposition in my head. So whenever I'm writing a chord, say I'm writing like a chord and like the G ocarina has like a written G and it's supposed to be a D, right? Uh, like at this point, I've almost memorized what all the G ocarinas look like on the staff. So it, it's easier for me to say, oh, I'm going to write a D and just write a G on that D ocarina line and skip the step of transposing it and transposing it again. Um, just because that works a little bit better for my brain. Um, I don't know. I, I think if I would have started septet arranging how you did, I probably would have written better septets at the beginning because my first couple of septets are just not that great. Um, but now that I've gotten more oh, experience and I know. It's the same thing for me. <laughs> we get better as we go, right? We learn the yeah. tricks of um, that's kind of, uh, that's how the sp like speed up process was for me, because I just want to look at it. Like I'm looking at a piano piece and I can just plug and go like, okay, here's a G like this was, uh, this Mayam and Parade of the Ten Soldiers. It was easy for me to see it because I could just like, okay, here's the melody line. I can just mm -hmm. put it directly into my C ocarinas, you know? And then the only time I would have to think about with the G ocarinas, like I, I could say, okay, I've got you know, I'm going to go back to this, this one. Like I could, I know that I could just write, let's go back to the inner voice part. Yeah. Like even here, like I just plug it into one of the G ocarinas just like this. And I wouldn't have to think about it. That's how I normally, I got you. That's I got how you. I would just kind of think about it. Well, I've got the Sopranos doing this. Yeah. So, very That's good. Is it any let me see if there's any questions. Is there any questions in the chat? Probably I do not. have a, I guess I have a, a question slash topic. If like, you know, if, if you have covered everything in your presentation and if like I could pick your brain about one thing. Yes. Okay. Cause when I heard you were doing this presentation, I was really excited. <laughs> I was the, the, the inner nerd in me. was like, I want to hear what he does and know how he does what he does. Um, so, okay. I would love to talk ab about with you what music doesn't work very well on an ocarina. If there's a specific genre or there's a specific style of music that doesn't work very well. And there's a follow-up to that question. Having that that doesn't work and trying to make it work. Okay. A lot of the times what kind of deters me from doing a piece, if it's just the melody line is going to be like is if the melody line itself has an extremely large range. Um, I usually deters me from doing a, a piece or if it's like at a key or just the range, it's not gonna fit very well. And I have to plug and play and put it in like between the C's and G's a lot. Uh, I'm gonna between two ocarinas. Oh, that's interesting. I, I generally don't do that, but you know, seeing it in action um, when, um, uh, Lori uh, Archer Sutherland wrote us a piece. She she did that a little bit, and I I, I like what she was able to do. Um, I was a little bit nervous about crossing of voices, um, and she she did a lovely job of doing it. Um, I sometimes I'm a, I'm more hesitant on doing it just because I think it can sound a little bit more disjunct. Uh, I think Jordan's going to talk about the way more uh, he does it a little bit maybe in as yeah. his coming up um but that is something that is a great question nicholas about how do i just you know why i pick that and how to make it work is kind of uh uh just like kind of was saying i try to kind of make it to where it just like seamless seamlessly goes between voices another thing i try to avoid in my writing is and uh, <laughs> Uh, Angela's going to be like, oh boy, Tim's going to talk about this, is same octave 
unisons. Um, I try to avoid to get things in for intonation wise because ocarinas are really hard to tune, right? I avoid same octave unisons as much as possible. If I can choose to put it in a different octave, I will. If, um, if I, especially in the sopranos of uh, voices, I don't like to write the soprano G and soprano C in the same range because they're going to be, it's a lot harder to tune those upper ocarinas. There's a lot less you can, uh, with changing and saying things. So I avoid same octave unison, uh, <laughs> like an all boss at all yeah. costs. That was worth the entire session, just that statement. Because I've never thought about it that way. And I, I literally have learned so much just from that little statement. Now that you said yeah. that. It's more that uh, you're going to be fighting each other more, more than anything. And I think it's hard, even in a virtual setting, um, because even if you've got, like, say you're listening to a um, your MIDI or your drone as you're playing, you might think you're close or on to in tune as best you can. But say if the other person is going the opposite direction, they're more on the sharp side, but they still think they sounded pretty good. Like it, it can sound really wonky <laughs> when I you're trying agree. to- I agree. Yeah, so I, I avoid as much happen. as possible, same octave unison. Now I will have like parts in octaves and generally um, intonations a little bit, uh, you, you might hear it, but it's not as obvious when it's the same exact like pitch. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Everyone's on a you know, C6 or something like that, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> it could be a fun, it's uh, just something I generally avoid when I'm picking that out. So much sense. Writing. See, when I was thinking about that question, <clears throat> I really struggle like with certain styles of music. Like for instance, I'm gonna use just a couple as an example like rock with a lot of guitar solos, um, rap with a lot of speaking voices, like speaking voices are extremely challenging for me to transcribe into any ocarina music, whether it's septets or anything, and especially if it's just an ocarina playing, like, right, it's just an ocarina playing, and they're trying to do either the vocals of a really loud vocal song that doesn't have a lot of harmony and has just a lot of, uh, like, repetitive fast words on the same note to spice it up and make it interesting what i do sometimes if i'm writing for something for septet i break up that same note and i put that same note like if it's like a rapping thing or it's a really fast speaking thing and they're on the same note i break it up into octaves and i go right and the rhythm just goes into like different vocal lines like that and that's a great way to adapt like saying something like if you have a drum part like how can you kind of incorporate you don't in, without writing a drum part how can you incorporate that into uh, like ocarina like or you know one of the things to kind of keep i think about for like uh, to kind of mimic that effect is like if you're doing like uh, like an alberti bass line or something to like or to list like a rhythm this uh, same rhythm within one ocarina part where they're just going data 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 to keep the rhythmic pulse of something so that's a great i see what you're exactly saying when you hear our septet this Sunday, I want to see if you could see what I did because I transcribed a song that uses like a lot of like synth drums and synth bass um, and synth guitar, and I did that exact same rhythm you just counted. It was like and it was like one ocarina was on the beat and the other one was on the beat, and it was sixteenth notes running the whole way around. Yes. So I'm yeah, proud, exactly what, you know, everything you were saying is like I on point of where I would probably do the same thing. <laughs> so yes, you picked out a very good way to make something that likely would have been or was challenging to write something like that for um, Ocarina. So um, I'm generally, you know, we've done, especially for Shooting Star, we've done a lot of just classical um, pieces that I know that um, like either like wind pieces have worked or just vocal pieces, um, you know, and uh, our piece coming up, I'm pretty excited to uh, just kind of see um, that we're going to be premiering on Sunday, just like um, how much, you know, different composers, everyone has their own like take on uh, writing for Ocarina and just picking out like what to have play 
And one of the things that I'm really excited that it's completely different style than what my writing is, is like I, I told you, I do a lot of more full kind of everyone playing as, you know, as much as possible where you're going to hear um, more like individual parts uh, sticking out. And yes, it's going to be epic. <laughs> I'm really excited for it. I, uh, Michael, uh, our Michael Pereira, who is our composer, is very excited for it too. We actually play with him in a group, me and Angela. Angela, it's really nice that we we both live next to each other because we can pick each other's brains and hang out. So that's one of the nice things I will say. I, I wish our other group members lived closer, but you know, the same thing for you. <laughs> We're all spread out. Yeah. I'm also lucky that my friend Travis lives close to me and I get to pick his brain a lot too. Um, so it's, it's just, it's nice. You're right to have septet members kind of live close by, but having a septet is hard, man. It's hard work. Yes. Y'all make it look easy. Me? Uh, you know what? They probably our uh, our Facebook chat is like going crazy every single day. Like, uh, I feel like I'm on my phone too much. <laughs> me too. Me too. I think, I think it's funny because, you know, like, there's just so many debates about like, you know, how to do things in the most artistic way or how to do things in the most like best way that everybody wants to do them as. And everybody's really passionate because they are in an ocarina septet. Like you can't get any more passionate about ocarina if you're in a septet already, right? I, I, at least I feel that way. Like I feel like you're so passionate you decided to join a septet with your free time. Like that is, that's really passionate. And then everybody just has like a different way that they want to like um, take the group or everybody has different ideas. And it's just, it's so hard to be a leader of that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And you know, what's nice is that, you know, when we formed, you know, I was kind of just asking her around, like, I didn't really know everyone that well. They kind of, some, uh, as a June reach out to me, like, it's just a bunch of things. And it ended up that we all had kind of these unique you know, skills to bring to the table, you know, somebody, you know, with arranging skills, video editing skills, I've started to learn how to video edit, you know, it's all those uh, great things, audio editing, Angela is getting amazing at it. So uh, thank you so much, Angela, I know you're in the chat. Um, just, you know, and kind of learning the ways and go to's, I'm just thankful for everyone I have in my group. And uh, I love you guys if you're in the chat or you like listening because you're awesome and you make uh, my music life every day just great. So um, thank you so much. I really don't have any much other things besides if anybody has any questions. Um, honestly, it's like me choosing the pieces like I've done here. I thought these two that I showed were kind of good examples of like how to like find a melody line that really works really well. Um, yeah. and then find the harmony that works really well. I had a yeah. lot of fun listening to this presentation. Let's give Tim a really big virtual applause and show in the chat um, that, please, if you don't mind. Uh, it was really good to have Tim. Like I said, like I don't think we've ever had a panel with Tim, so I'm like, I cannot miss this one. I got to be like 100% present. And he presented some really interesting topics. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to definitely have to go back and rewatch some of them. Um, cause I was trying to, uh, make sure that our email list for the first five minutes was up and in the right place, but I'm just extremely happy that we got a chance to have a session with you, Tim, and that we also were able to have some of the shooting star people here in the chat represent shooting star. I'm really happy to, and excited to hear y'all's premiere tomorrow. If y'all haven't subscribed to shooting star Ocarina or Tim, Timothy Kernabrob, then definitely do that right now. They are amazing musicians and a great online virtual band. I love their work. They are so professional and make it look easy. They make it look easy. They make it look easy. <laughs> well, I'm glad you think we make it look easy. It's not always that easy. <laughs> I know it's not. That's why I, it, I'm impressed whenever I see y'all's videos. It's amazing. Uh, but anyway, I'm just, I'm, I'm really happy about this and um, I'm going to go ahead and um, take us to our next session, which is going to be a break. <laughs> um, but I do want to get to one Q&A because I don't think I got to this Q&A. And I hope, Madison, I hope you're still here. Um, this is one of the questions that I wanted to try to answer. I didn't have time. She asked it during my presentation and I saw it afterwards because 
my brain just doesn't work in checking chat like you guys like yours does you were so good about checking chat i was not um i just had it up when we were doing the notes and i didn't see this one because everything was going fast so it says i have a quick question and if you want to answer it with me tim you're welcome to um i have a quick question I love playing my ocarina and would enjoy sharing it with other people, but I always seem to be playing it at the wrong place at the wrong or the wrong time. Where's a good place to play my ocarina? Where's a good place? Um, mm -hmm. Like to practice. Uh, like, uh, first of all, to practice, I always try to find a room that I can find as farther as seclusion as possible because they can be really loud. And especially if you know, if you have other people living in your house, yeah. <laughs> they can be like, oh my gosh, that thing is really loud. Um, for events, like, um, practice, if you can find practice rooms that are, um, you know, even at music studios to kind of practice, um, you can rent out a room. Um, I've done that to practice with other people before. Uh, a lot of music studios or even music stores will have practice rooms. Um, you know, gigs, you know, if you can find any kind of playing gig, you know, even if it's just, you know, what is that called? Busking. Yeah. <laughs> and I've never really done yeah. it, done it, uh, done it before. So, it's so much um, fun. yeah. Or just sitting on a bench in a, you know, park and you're playing your instrument, you know, I who cares about the heck about this uh, David session yesterday? Um, <laughs> he was suggesting, you know, like, just like the suggestions that you gave a minute ago, but he was also saying um, that there were different, um, like, places at universities, you could rent out a practice room. And I suggested, maybe if you have a local public library, that may be a really mm -hmm. good place to start because they do have some rooms there. And if you're like really hungry for a, a practice room, like or just a room where you can be sound isolated and you don't have anybody, you know, like listening to you, judging you or anything like that, try to see if you can rent out a library room to practice. You'd be surprised. Um, they may have some available at your local library. Um, and, you know, like it's it, like you said, I, I want to find somewhere isolated. I want to find somewhere like where it's just me. Um, so I would do the same thing that you said, Tim. I would just also look for a room in the library because it might be free. Yes, and rent might be very cheap at a library. You know, a conference room might only be like five bucks an hour or something like that or That's something. Fair. Yes. So I'm actually trying to start a clarinet. It would be nice to start a clarinet choir around here. Ooh, very cool. Chicago suburbs, we, we, um, there's only like either you go downtown Chicago or the one I play in all the way in Crystal Lake. So they're very far uh, distances between each other and there needs to something to be somewhere in the middle ground. So Does I hope Angela to... also play clarinet. Uh, she's mostly an oboist. I know she can play clarinet really well, but I don't think she would want to be part of a clarinet choir. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. It's more like probably that oboe clarinet rivalry kind of thing. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, there is a rivalry going on there for sure. Don't talk about soprano sax with her. <laughs> if she's still there, she'll be like, oh gosh, soprano sax sounds too much like oboe English horn. It doesn't need to be. That's funny. That's very funny. <laughs> Let it, oh, let it be an oboe or English. Uh, uh, well, I'm just telling the truth, Angela. I, I'm telling, you know, I get your perspective. I get your perspective on this. Like uh, my instrument, if my instrument sounds like another, funny. I would I would totally say the same thing. That's too funny. She just said, are you making fun of me? <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. Well, I'm, I'm going to let y'all go so we can have our break. And we'll be back at 1 p.m. You will not want to miss this section, this next session, y'all. You will not want to miss it. Jordan Moore. He's going to be talking about arranging for ocarina ensembles. All of this that we've been doing is totally stuff for making you a better ocarina player, but also to help you be more aware um, of yourself in, the, in terms of music. It's not just being an ocarina player. It's being a musician, you know, like... I always like one of the things that I always get onto people about is like they will play ocarina, they'll play by ear, they'll play pretty well, and they'll have a song or two that they love and they just play it. And they're like, I'm not a musician. I just play ocarina. I just know these songs. I'm like, you are a musician. Sure. You play music. A musician is someone who plays music. We are all musicians. <clears throat> and you can work on the part of yourself that is a musician away from the ocarina. 
And I feel like that's like a really, it was, that was a mind blowing thing when I was learning cello and I realized, whoa, there's so much more to music than just cello. <laughs> so that, that was really cool. I really, I, I had fun with that. I had a really great time, but anyway, I'm, I'm going to get off my soapbox now, stepping off. It's I'm okay. Y'all we all need to enjoy lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'll let y'all have a break and we'll be back at 1 p.m. Central Time. Thank you again, Tim. Everybody say thank you. You're very Thank-y, welcome. Tim. You guys have a great one. We'll see you all at one. Bye, everyone. Bye.